Chapter 18, A Cage of Light. One day, Matt began, I attended a private dinner for scientists on the subject of cold light. One of the men, Martin Larimore, told us the high points of a discovery of his. He had nearly perfected a formula using the phenomenon of fireflies and expected to complete it soon. A short time after the speech, all his blueprints and notes were stolen. His listeners gasped, but said nothing. He continued, Some careful detective work revealed that two renegade scientists were the probable culprits. What were their names? Nancy asked. Michael W. Brink and Samuel H. Jones. Matt went on to say that the two men had vanished. It was assumed they had gone to some secret place to put the finishing touches on the formula and then present it as their own. I have a strong feeling that the pair may be in this very woods. He turned to Doria. Are they? There was no reply. Although the suspect had made no comment during Matt's astounding revelation, she had listened intently. Her eyes were like burning coals and full of hatred for her captors. The professor continued. He said Larimore had mentioned that the unknown quantity in the formula directly involved fireflies. George spoke up. So this would be an ideal time and place for those renegade scientists to work. There are lots of fireflies here, and certainly it is a secluded spot. Nancy agreed. Do you know what I suspect? That Welch and Hornsby may be Michael's and Sam's middle names. At this, Doria jumped, but still she said nothing. It was only a moment later that George noticed the young woman trying to inch away from the group. She may try to escape, George thought, and moved nearer her. Doria looked at the girl in dismay. She could not flee from her captors. As Matt finished his story about the renegade scientists, he turned to Doria. I'm giving you a choice of leading us to these men or of being taken directly to the sheriff. His remark was followed by a prolonged period of silence as the others watched Doria closely. Her expression did not change. Okay, Matt said. Let's go. Once more, the captured girl pleaded innocence, but no one paid any attention to her. She was prodded along and carefully guarded. As they reached the foot of the mountainside and headed for Nancy's convertible, a state police car came along. Ned hailed it and the driver stopped. What's going on here? Asked the officer beside him. He turned a flashlight directly into the faces of the group. Doria instantly covered hers with one hand. Is something wrong, miss? The other officer asked her. Nancy introduced herself and quickly explained. This young woman is the one wanted in connection with that vacation hoax. Congratulations, the driver remarked. We've been looking everywhere for her. We think she's been hiding up in the woods, Nancy replied. The officer said it would not be necessary for Nancy or any of the others to come with them since they had a warrant for the young woman's arrest. What is your name? he asked the prisoner. She still refused to answer, so Nancy replied, Doria Sampler Hornsby. She purposely did not mention Matt's suspicion about the two renegade scientists up in the woods. Actually, the young sleuth and her friends had no concrete evidence against them. As soon as the police had driven away with their prisoner, Nancy announced that she would like to climb right back up the mountainside and try to find Welch and Hornsby. The others were eager to go, so all of them set off once more. They followed the path to the point where they had captured Doria, then looked for shoe prints and trodden grass. They were able to detect an indistinct trail. I think that we should be as quiet as possible, Ned warned. We don't want to scare the men away if they're in the area. George grinned, nor give Sam a chance to put on one of his scare costumes. The five trudged along in silence with Nancy, Ned, and Matt in the lead. Finally, they reached the spot where Nancy had overheard the conversation between Sam and Mike. There were voices again. 
One man was saying, I'm worried. Doria should have been back by this time. Something must have happened to her. Another voice said, you worry too much. First it's Doria, then the police, and then those people in the cabin. Try to calm down. That's all right for you to say, retorted the man, whose voice Nancy now recognized as Sam's. But she happens to be my wife. I'm going to look for her. Have it your own way, Michael answered. But what makes you think you'll find her? Remember, she said something about taking a trip to New York City. Sam did not answer. Instead, he said, Listen, Mike, if anyone starts snooping around, put on my green suit or the ghost outfit. The excited listeners realized now that the voices were coming from underground. Nancy waved her friends back, indicating they were to station themselves behind trees. She herself chose one nearby so she could watch carefully. Half a minute later, she saw a tangled mass of briars rise up from the earth. A camouflaged wooden trap door! A man climbed from the pit. He was about to close the trap door when his partner called up. I'm coming with you. It's too dangerous for you to go alone. Both men had flashlights, and by their beams, the hidden group could see the stranger's faces plainly. Nancy and George had never seen either of them before. As they walked away, Nancy noted that the one she associated with Sam's voice walked with a slightly uneven gait. His shoe prints undoubtedly matched those the girls had found a few days earlier. Michael was taller and walked with a straight stride. As soon as the suspects were out of sight and hearing, the group gathered. Nancy suggested... Let's investigate that pit while we have the chance. Ned and Matt were game, but thought someone should keep a lookout. George and Bert offered. If somebody is coming, I'll give our special bird call, George told Nancy. The trap door was lifted. Attached to the side of the pit was a rope ladder. Matt climbed down first, then Ned, and finally Nancy. The three found themselves in an amazingly large, well-lighted cavern. Undoubtedly, it was man-made. Nancy wondered if, during the occupation of Indians at Otsego, the boys in the tribe had used it either for ceremonies or for play. Pioneer soldiers may even have camped here, she said to herself. There was a center section with a room on either side. One of these proved to be a laboratory, the other was a huge cage of fine mesh wire filled with fireflies. Most of them were roosting in an artificial tree. The light they created together was dazzling. Apparently the center section of the pit was used for living purposes, since there were three cots, a stove, and a refrigerator. Three cots indicate that Doria may stay here, Nancy remarked. And look! Under one lay the scare costumes and several flashlights with green bulbs. Good evidence, Ned commented. I guess those men have their own electric plant, Matt remarked, looking around. Although I don't see their source of power. Ned grinned. Maybe the continuous twinkling of the fireflies is enough illumination for their experiments. The visitors were so fascinated by the luminescent beetles that they watched them for several minutes. I can't take my eyes off them, Nancy said, interrupting the silence. Cold light, Matt murmured. One of these days we'll be carrying flashlights that go off and on with the same ease, power, and cold light of these little creatures. Ned thought that they should start their search for the stolen papers. We don't know how long those men will be gone, he reminded Nancy and Matt. The professor laughed. Where Doria is now would be the last place her husband and his friend would think of looking for her. You mean in jail? Nancy asked. That's right. And Doria wouldn't dare communicate with the men to supply bail for her. Maybe she couldn't get it anyway after swindling all those people, Ned remarked. That's a fair guess, Matt agreed. The three stopped talking and now began to examine the underground laboratory. The stolen notes and blueprints were not in sight. 
Nancy said she felt reluctant about looking in the stranger's luggage. Maybe we won't have to, Matt said. He, Nancy, and Ned slowly cast their eyes about the center room. Finally, they went back to the laboratory. Under a workbench, Nancy saw a small chest. Maybe there's something in that, she said hopefully. End of chapter 18